When the world gets better, let's build a better world. Of better values and choices. With cleaner homes, cleaner energy, cleaner coastlines. With better products from better materials. Using less, but giving more. When the world gets better, let's just get better and better. Miele, immer besser. Welcome to Fed Square. We've got the future food system behind us and Jeremy here from Breve Architecture, Jeremy McLeod. Hey. Like I said, a real architect's here to explain <laughs> what the hell's going on. Um, as I've been doing, I've been explaining what's uh, going on. We've had a bit of a tough week here. I lost one of my favorite uncles on uh, Thursday, which really sent me into a bit of a spin, even though he lived a good life. But the guy, um, was a huge inspiration for me and kind of the last person left that reminded me of my dad. And um, so, yeah, Friday was a tough day. It happened actually Friday morning. And um, I think it, I don't know what it was, but everyone just got, you know, uh, behind it and we just got a hell of a lot done this weekend. And yeah, the last four weeks have been fantastic. We've done some, some um, great stuff like the floors now laid, the earthing floor, um, we've tested it and we'll show you in a minute how that works. Uh, we've got some fresh fish coming on Wednesday and we've managed to get the system working properly now and we're about to actually set up the, the solar system. So as you can see there's some solar, solar um, panels that have been installed over the weekend. So it's all starting to really fall into place and we're pretty confident that by Friday we'll have most of the work done, even though there's still a lot to do. Um, yeah, so Jeremy, thanks. It's been five weeks since we were here last. It seems like a lot's happened since I've been here last. Um, I came down from Fed Square this way, looked across the balustrade and saw the building uh, totally coming to life and green kind of hanging over the edge. Uh, last time I was here, Joe was showing me these tiny little seedlings and uh, here yeah. we are, and nothing has been eaten by caterpillars by the looks of things, Yost. <laughs> <laughs> We've got to feed the yabby somehow. So, no, it's, it, it's a really good way to show that soil is the most important yeah. thing. You know, people, even people that garden all the time have come and said, wow. Yeah. We planted, Joe, what was it? L late August, 25th of August, I think we planted most of the stuff from seed. So I've really determined to plant everything from seed. So diggers gave me a whole box of seed and yeah, we've got everything from soy, even soybeans are like that big now and you'll see that in a minute. But yeah, this is a really good um, way to see. There'll be three layers of plants. So you've got the top layer, which is my favorite way of growing plants, which is the wicking bed at the top. And what I love is when you have these downpours, like last night we had, I don't know how many mils of rain and this morning I arrived and not one of, we hadn't lost a drop of rain. So every, all that rain was captured, which means that for the next two weeks, you don't need to water those. Uh, it's all in the wicking beds. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's, that's an incredible, like what we do in Melbourne is get these big downpours during summer. And then it just in a conventional garden, it just sort of washes mm -hmm. away. With a wicking bed, it gets collected. So each one of those barrels, um, at its capacity is about 100 litres. So you can hold 100 litres of water, which means that you can go down to lawn for a couple of weeks in January and your garden doesn't die because it's got, it's like a battery. Well, even if you don't have wicking beds, you can use water tanks, right, to kind of flatten out the big rains to the dry periods. And so you can use that water tank to water your garden over yeah. time. Admittedly, Yoast, wicking beds are the best. <laughs> well, Ross Harding told me the other day yeah. that Melbourne, there's 10 times more water that falls in Melbourne than it uses. Yeah, right. Which is pretty, that's a pretty amazing stat. So perhaps we should do something about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I did notice when I was standing here looking down here, um, there are lots of panels here. These are Australian made panels installed by some of my favorite electricians, BREC Energy. But can you tell me um, what it is that it's about these panels? Why are they on different angles? How big is your solar array? How many panels do you have? Well, yeah. Luke's here, so we should go and see him. Okay. He's actually inside and uh, yeah, I'm actually, I've learned so much it's, from him. Uh, what time is it? Seven o'clock? Luke's still here? Uh, I think he'd prefer to work 24 hours a day to get it done. Okay, cool. All right, we'll talk to Luke well, Let's go and find him. Okay. But yeah, what's really, he's, he's really obsessed about, you know, getting the system. So you've got morning sun uh, during the day, winter. You know, he's always got his phone out testing, you know, is it going to capture the sun in July? Uh, te it's, testing the sun angles at different times of the year. Yeah. And of course, most people, you know, there's a spike in use early in the morning. Can we talk about the water tank? Yeah, sure. 
So just talking about water tanks, how big is your water tank? So that's uh, 10 and a half thousand liters. Okay. But we're only using that for drinking and showers. Okay. Because all the other water that we're using is captured and, and uh, filtered through the, the shipping container tank. Okay. So, and, and we're only collecting water off the solar panels that's going into that. And why is that? Because solar panels super clean. Because it's glass, it's yeah. clean, yeah. and uh, and then we've we've got no what's PVC. This made of, what's this made of? Yeah, stainless it's steel. Stainless steel. Yeah, Food made grade. in Geelong, mate. <laughs> so yeah, I'm just I'm a bit obsessed about that. I, I mean, I don't mind in ground concrete tanks, mm. but I think stainless steel is a great way to store, you know, um, yeah. rainwater. And if you actually work out what you use just for cooking and and showers, it's not that much. And then of course that water then gets captured, goes through a worm farm system it's called Wormworks, and then after that it gets filtered and gets goes into a natural pool and then we use that for the garden okay so nothing is wasted really <laughs> and also i guess the benefit of the stainless steel tank is that theoretically at the end of this building's life it'll never rust yeah but at the end of this building what do they life, say like 95 percent of the world's stainless steel is just still gets, just gets reused still here, you yeah know? just gets reused and reused yeah so yeah. it's got a kind of you know well yeah. the beauty about it is it doesn't degrade you know like yeah. it doesn't rust so yeah and it tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> so All we've right. got a solar panel balustrade going along here. Here he is. <laughs> the sparky hasn't left yet. No, mate. I'm still climbing up. <laughs> Tools are everywhere. Hey, Luke. This is Luke. I think we're going to do this oh, one yeah. still. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're going to keep doing it. <laughs> so we want to know mm. why you've designed a system the way you've designed it. Like, why are the solar panels facing east, solar panels facing west, some facing, you know, why have you got... Them? And why are they on different angles, and how big is the array? Ah, oh, the array, <laughs> uh, we've got about 10 kilowatts up there, 10.8. Yeah. Um, they are spread, a few in the east, majority north, and then a fair chunk in the west, but ideally we need to track Matt and Joe's load characteristics. Yeah. You know, we need to, you know, they may be using power between the hours of, say, 8 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon, which is great. You know, if that was the, the recipe, we'd be facing them east and north. And if, you know, if they had no load in the afternoon, nothing, you know, we wouldn't need solar panels out there. But because they're going to be here all day, and potentially cooking all day, and prepping all day, we need to make sure that we've got solar production when they're here live doing it. So, and, and then, you know, given that they're going to have, you know, uh, the... Um feeding different people at different times of the day, mm -hmm. then have you got battery storage in there as well to kind of help shape that out? Heaps. <laughs> Heaps of battery storage. Look, I mean, we it was a leading question because yeah, the no, ghost, ghost did show me last time. <laughs> well, look, we're, we're prepared for a couple of days mm. with no solar. I mean, we, we need to have a bit of a fail safe here. Yeah. So we've got plenty of backup yeah. um, for that if need be. Plus, you know, this is all about working with the system as well. So it's about you know, if you know, you can't, you, you just leave things till the sun comes out again, you know. Mm. And I think that Matt and Joe are definite, definitely those kinds of people that will work. Okay, we've got some good weather coming up. Let's save the washing. Yeah. Till that weather comes up, we'll get the washing machine going when we get a sunny day. And Yeah, well, and that, that's all part of the education process. I mean, you don't just install a solar system and give them the keys to the, to the solar <laughs> and nick off. Uh, you're never going to get anything out of how the solar works. So yeah. the more Matt and Joe know about how to use the power, when to use the power, and, and as you said, when to prep for the days ahead. Yep. Uh, that's absolutely vital for the survival of the system. Yep. Yeah. And maybe, could we see the inverters? Do you want to show yeah, us the can. inverters? Probably. After you, Yost. See, uh, Luke's got bare feet. He's getting ready for the uh, earthing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I've got mud on my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to come in? Uh, and I'll shut this door. We've got a front door now. So, yeah, Luke, can you tell us, you know, it looks like you've got more than one inverter. Um, can you tell us what the equipment is that you've got here and what it's trying to do? Absolutely. We've got a couple of solar inverters, uh, Cronus and Austrian brand, um, very well made. So what they would do is invert the voltage produced by the solar panels, which is a DC voltage, and inverting it over to AC so the premises can use it. So it's 240 volt AC. Yep. So the voltage coming into the inverters are forever fluctuating, depending on how much sun or how many how much exposure there is to the uh, PV cells. Um, that'll invert the voltage, convert it to 240 volts, and then either charge the batteries via the multi-mode inverter, that's a self-tronic S. What's, what's that called, multi-mode inverter? Multi-mode inverter, so okay. it can charge and discharge. It's like a hybrid okay. style of, of inverter. Yep. So this here can invert 
the voltage or the power produced from the solar back to DC to charge the, uh, charge the batteries and then discharge the batteries when, after the sun goes down so Matt and Joe can use the power at night time. Okay, great. Yeah. Sounds so simple. And have you, have, you worked, <laughs> have you worked with these batteries before? No, I haven't. No, okay. And I'm quite excited to see how they run. I do yeah. know that they are quite slow moving. So yeah. very slow charge and yeah. takes a long time to discharge, which is good. Yeah. So that's when I said, when we have a couple of days of no sunlight, this is our saving grace. But you guys showed me some photos of a battery just like this that are like 50 years old and still working. So it blows my mind. Yeah. It absolutely blows my mind. If you see the warranty of batteries these days, sometimes the, the return on investment runs further mm, yeah. than the warranty period. Yeah. And when you know that these things are going to work for decades on end, that's where yeah. my money's going to be. I mean, there's a big footprint of batteries. There are other... If, 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 if you were to so. do this system in Tesla, yeah. Batteries, let's say. What? How much space would it be? Like a quarter of the space? Yes, maybe a fifth. Wow, that's a big difference, isn't it? Yeah. But the benefit, I think, that you were talking about uh, last month, Yos, was the idea with the nickel iron batteries is that at the end of this life, like everything else in this building, yep. it can be reused, broken down to nickel and iron and yep. reused. It's a very simple yeah. recycling process. Yep. And the beauty as well is that it's alkaline, not acid. So, um, I know of people that actually use it as a herbicide, so they kill weeds in their driveway <laughs> with, with it, but it actually becomes awful. food. So, you know, it's not toxic, so you can actually use it on your plants if you dilute it enough because it's got all the nutrients in it. Yep. And, you know, the crazy thing is that they actually absorb carbon, as I said last time. You know, if these have been cycled in for about... So, that's the thing about nickel iron that, that I've learned from speaking to people. If you've got a beach house and you go there once every three months, mm -hmm. they won't work for you unless you leave the fridge on, you leave lights on. So they need a bit of load running. They, you need to use them continuously, yeah. whereas other batteries, you know, you can flick stuff on. But you can see here the amount of carbon that one battery pulls from the atmosphere. Well, it's still a bit dark in here, Luke. Can you get the lights going for us, mate? I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, it's only, it's only, like, it's only like quarter past seven. Why, you know? We have plenty of sun in between the rain. We've got to eat more carrots. <laughs> uh, Yos, what else are you going to show me today? Well, I just, uh, you know, we, we've spoken about many of the, well, it's been great actually working with you guys because you're as passionate about sustainability as what both Jeremy and I are. And one of the first things that I said to you, can we go PVC free? And then you rolled up with a, thing of cable and you said right this is the stuff this you know this is the stuff yeah we've got some low smoke zero halogen cable which is pvc free um it's not made in australia i did the research today unfortunately it's not um but in the event where if, if there were to be a fire here um pvc is quite toxic mm. if you accidentally you know burn a plastic bag and get the fumes you know it's bad for mm. you with this stuff it doesn't ignite um so if you're looking um at a safety perspective if, if it was ever going to erupt or they had too much power running through it, it's never going to cause any harm to human beings. And, and you can break it down and recycle it. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I know, I know quite a few people that it's their business to break down, you know, uh, electrical cable and stuff out of, especially we retrofit buildings all the time. And there's, there's no thought that goes into how stuff gets recycled, which does my head in. Yeah, look, I mean, we... We've got scrap copper from most jobs that we always take back to Brett HQ, and that's our Christmas beer fund. Yep. Um, and you know, we, we make more money if we strip the copper from the insulation. Yeah, um, it's seven times more, I think, you get for the. Damn yeah. straight, yeah, we know. Yeah. <laughs> if we've got to slow down, that's what the apprentices do. Um, yeah. In this case, we can still do that and at least do something with the insulation now as opposed to turfing it. Yeah. So I want to ask you, do you think, you've been in this game for a while, do you think that there's real moment, momentum now and movement towards doing things sustainably, more so than, say, five or ten years ago? It, yes, yes, absolutely. It is a bit of a hard sell because of the dollar that's attached to it, yep. the dollar sign. Um, but it's, it's more and more attractive. People are way more aware about how much damage we are doing as individuals mm. just by the... A lot of small... Uh, you know, bad practices adds up across the population to something terrible, and everyone's yep. really starting to think that you know, by you know, using the right cable, installing solar on their house, 
And, you know, and, and another, another thing that people are blown away by, we've got solar panels made in South Australia by Tindo, yep. which yep, you that's sell that's here. What yeah, yep. yeah, that's what we're using. And then, you know, this is made in Chernside Park, you know. Right. <laughs> Who would have thought? And these guys have been going since 64, 1964, family-owned business. Yep, that's right. Um, they are the best bloody inverter. It's unparalleled. Yep. Worldwide. Yep. There's, they're nerds who do it right. And made in Chernside Park, Melbourne. I oh, know. <laughs> <laughs> Panels made in Adelaide, that's, that's, you know, the carbon footprint getting products from these places as opposed to importing something over from, say, China, which is, you know, a, a big contributor from solar products. Yeah. So it's, it so leaps and bounds ahead. Tell us so, about the, what, what is the world's longest experiment or study on solar panels in, in, uh, near Darwin? Oh, no, yeah, it's in Alice Springs. So oh, Alice Springs. A, uh, if you jump online and look at something called Desert Knowledge, they've got, uh, you know, 50 or 60 different 5 kilowatt solar systems, so you can kind of compare your apples with apples. So you've got 5 kilowatts worth of Tindo panels on a specific inverter, then you've got 5 kilowatts worth of Vonaco panels, and you can kind of see how they react right next to each other. So there's a controlled environment, literally being the environment, because they're right next to each other, and the performance characteristics of you know, specifically Tindo, you know, I'm not going to say skyrockets above the rest, but it's it's always up there. It's yeah. fantastic, and that's you know, it's made in Australia. An Australian made panel. Yeah, that's it. Made for Australian conditions. That's. I, I mean, I, I say this often, but like we've. I built my place, we moved in in 2006, and the guy that put the solar system, we had BP solar panels made in Sydney. Wow, ancient, yeah. And yeah. the guy said, there's about 65,000 houses, 64, 65,000 houses in Australia that have solar panels now. And he was going, how good is this? I've been doing this since the 70s, and it's taking off. He'd be an absolute guru, I want to meet the guy. Yeah. And now it's like two and a half million. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's flooded. It, 14 well, years. That is insane. That's a great thing. It is a, a good statistic. It is making network, uh, well, you know, power distributors, it make, it's making their job a lot harder. So that kind of comes back at the installer. So our, um, our routine of actually getting an approval for a solar system, a lot of those solar systems can't export power now. Yep. Because if you can imagine you know, cloud covering the sun and then the sun pokes its head out and everyone's solar system is now producing all this power and no one's home, everyone's at work and all this power's rushing back into the system. You've got kind of generator versus generator. You get a lot of voltage rise issues. Um, so there can be some unreliable grid areas. But, now, but saturation solar. now we're seeing companies like Green Sync and Reposit that work with your battery storage mm -hmm. to you know, work with the retailer to tell it when to discharge the batteries yep. and when it can discharge back VPP, into the grid. VPP, so, I was part of Australia's yeah, yeah. first yeah. ever attempt at a VPP, VPP so uh, virtual, virtual power plant. Yeah, okay, That's cool. That's right. So yeah. look, it, it's, it's quite beneficial to, yeah. to the homeowner's pocket if they do want to yeah. participate in that because they get charged a, a certain rate, so like almost a wholesale rate. Instead of yeah. getting charged 30 cents a kilowatt hour, they'll get look for three years if you sign up with us, we're charging 20 cents a kilowatt yeah. hour for everything that you use. Um, you know, there's, there's fine print involved in that, but you don't necessarily own <clears throat> the power stored in your battery. Yeah. If the grid needs it, they'll discharge yeah. and export. If you look at warranties of batteries, they either go through a certain amount of years mm. or how many cycles you yeah. go through. So if you're, let's just say you're not home for a couple of days and your battery cycles three or four times and you're not there, that could contribute to you, oh, mm. no more warranty, mm. five years time, yep. you need to make a claim. So with the right education, I, I kind I, of feel like... I, I kind of feel that the time now, because of you know, the wage, we, we're paying so, such high wages in Australia. So let's say, um, I, I think that the system is now almost more viable to be a decentralized system mm -hmm. than a centralized system. So if you look at, I've got a friend that works on a truck and they cut the limbs off trees on power lines. Yep. So you've got two people you're managing traffic, you've got a guy on the truck, you've got somebody in a boom, and he said it, cha -ching, cha -ching. That, that it's like sense. a night, if they do it for a night, it's like, you know, five, six thousand dollars for a night, and then next year they've got to go back and cut the same tree again. And yeah. you times that by, you know, and every year I think it's two or three hundred thousand power poles need to be replaced. And so you've got this, suddenly the costs of maintaining that system are now so high, mm -hmm. and the energy that people are consuming, I, I believe it's 54 percent reduction in Victoria's energy use in the last five years overall, yeah. yet our population has grown by half a million. So you've got a huge drop in energy demand because we've got such, we're, you know, adopting great like heat pumps instead of conventional hot water systems. Mm -hmm. We're using LED lights. 
we're only scratching the surface. I think that our energy use and consumption is going to drop even more. So you've got these power companies that are like holding this really expensive infrastructure that they can't, and suddenly people go, well, why would I connect to the grid? You're, tra you're charging me a fortune to connect to the grid. Yeah. Like it cost my brother, it was going to cost him $50,000 to get power brought to his new house in Buxton. Wow. And it cost him $48,000 to be off grid. Yeah, well, it's so, a no brainer. And, and you <laughs> never get electricity bill. No, <laughs> I think I think I, I I think he's the exception rather than the rule because I, I kind of think as a system the idea of the virtual power plant or us living in a city of five million people that we can share our solar share our storage and yeah. kind of you know it means that you know a whole bunch of houses can help kind of power the Royal Children's Hospital for example on a peak demand day. Yep. You know, so I do feel like that there is benefit to both. Like you know, and, and when we live in an urban area where you know. Where I do most of my time, I do see the opportunity for all of us to come together, do our bit, put solar on our roof, you know, look at storage, look at being part of uh, Green Sink, you know, and look at, you know, how do we be part of the energy solution that doesn't rely on someone burning coal? Yeah. So, absolutely. you know, I feel like that we can help, you know, be part of that system. So, you know, it's two, well, sides, I mean, two sides of the same coin. But there's a win in both situations, yeah. really. The more people that put in battery walls and the more that we're all connected, the, you know, the mm -hmm. microgrid... It's Could. education. You know, you can't just slap one of these things mm -hmm. on everyone's, or in everyone's house and yep. think it's going to work. People need to be educated correctly on how the flow of energy goes and the demands and, and tariffs work. I mean, after we do every job, if we don't, mm -hmm. I, was, I was saying this to you before, just throw some of the keys and <laughs> there's your solar system. You need to invest the time in someone and I don't really want to leave anybody's side if they don't know what the hell is going on. Because yep. if I put my hand on my heart and go, look, this is costing you 10 grand, it'll mm -hmm. save you about... Two and a half thousand dollars a year in your electricity bills. Four grand, you know, four years later, you should have your money back. Yeah. And I'm pretty confident at every time I put that on paper and give it to somebody, and I need to ensure that that yeah. that maths turns out. So I need to make sure that that client knows exactly how and when to use their power. And also, I'm mindful about their capital expense as well. You don't have to spend all the money in the world. Yeah. And people go, oh, I want to be off grid. I want to be off grid. I need a battery. <laughs> More often than not, I'm having an interview with a client <laughs> for me to justify, go, okay, look, yeah, that warrants you getting a battery. Because ideally, if you want a good return on investment, you want to charge that battery by the excess solar mm. power that you're producing. If you're paying to charge your battery... Yeah, it doesn't then, make sense. Well, look, it, it, it works. The model works. It's, it's called tariff locking, so you can charge your battery at off-peak and use it at peak. But then if you look at the warranties, more often than not, they'll stretch out beyond... The warranty of the battery. Mm. So ideally what we're going to do is take baby steps, install the solar system, analyze the data from that because if they're, if they've got a solar system and husband, wife, two kids, going to work, going to school uh, and no one's home during the day and they're producing all this solar and exporting, well that, that's a perfect recipe for a battery. Instead of exporting that power for 10 cents a kilowatt or bugger all, you yep. might as well store that. Mm. So when you come home from work and the price of electricity goes up and the sun's setting and you're no longer producing solar, at least you can hack into your battery. Yep. Because you're avoiding that peak price period. So again, the education on how it all works is far more important than the system itself. Like if you employ me to do the system, the system will work bloody well. Yep. But mm. I need to invest that time. That's yeah, and, and I think important. that um, it's worth noting too that um, you know, as part of the coronavirus stimulus package from the Victorian state government, there's been a massive um, push now mm -hmm. for more rebates for solar. Oh, yeah. So if you don't have solar, go get it now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the, the other thing it's important to note is that if you are buying power, you should buy 100% certified green power. Because if you're not, then there's coal in the energy that's providing energy to your house. So when you're bored after this, get online, change to 100% certified green power. <laughs> And then, it, it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's like it's like four cents extra a kilowatt hour. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Thanks, mate. Hey, Thanks, Luke. And I'll see you tomorrow morning. <laughs> All, right. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, what we're looking at here is we haven't actually um, finished the floor completely here, and you can see the copper wire. Co copper wires between. Oh yeah, okay, between the tiles. Yeah, so we've spent so much time testing and trying to work out what is the easiest way to actually lay an earthing floor. So we discussed and we actually had a lot of feedback about the earthing floor. And um, so the idea is that you connect it to the Earth's mag magnetic, magnetic field. And so you're, you're able to discharge any, um, 
radiation that your body absorbed because you know we're so we we're seventy percent water, and so I was really keen to develop a floor that allowed you to do that. And I want everybody that walks in when we finish to walk in bare feet and experience the place bare feet, like you would in a beach in a garden. And so yeah, we laid it five hundred different ways, and we trial. We spent two weekends trialing. In the end, I got so frustrated, and it turns out that the easiest way to do it is to do it this way. And so we've just stripped some cable and, and laid it in and you can either plug it into a wall so that you're um, using the earth in the wall or you can actually connect it to a rod in the ground and, and the way you would earth a building from an electric point of view. The easiest way to do it is to get lucky to do it, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Yost, it feels, and it, feels, it feels quite cool to touch at the moment. Yeah. But, you know, last time I was here, you know, you were running hydronic under the floor. And it looks like you've got copper running under the floor here. Yes. So and, we've got and then you've got Eltron, um, and then you've got this thing. Hot water service that is um, that was there, but because we had to finish tiling the floor, we've actually moved it out of the way. And that does both hot water and um, our hydronic heating. Yeah. It's about seventy-five to eighty percent more efficient than a conventional hot water service. So this is a heat pump. Yes. And so it works like a, like an air conditioner. Um, like a, you know, but it does it for water instead. I know, of, but yeah. it's. I still can't get my head around how it works. Can you? <laughs> it's like, I had like a, my chemistry teacher explaining it to me. <laughs> so. it's like it, it's like in Holland, it's minus twenty, and it gets heat from the air. How yeah. does that work? You know. So basically, what it does is it pulls air from outside through and and collect, and takes out the heat, and it, it can work at you know below zero with minor temperature differentials yeah 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 but it's so efficient and um, there's again the Victorian government have huge incentives to install these and you should because they are so much more efficient than a conventional hot water service and importantly it runs on electricity yes not gas so That's it's right. more efficient than gas much more efficient than gas and it runs on electricity well, it's 75% so. more efficient than gas yeah and uh, uh, the numbers on um, Electricity are huge. It's and, higher. So, and, and if we want to be building a future without a lot of carbon in our construction industry, we need to be doing it with electricity. Yeah, and the beauty about this is as well, you can actually connect it to the system so that when you've got a lot of energy, it actually, um, it's, it's another uh, battery. It's no so different it's, to that battery, really. So using the hot water to store um, thermal energy. Yep. So using that as a battery when there's lots of solar in it. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Yep. Luke's setting all that up for us. Yeah, okay, cool. And then, of course, you know, we've got the <laughs> condensation <laughs> that comes up. Using free connect systems when that hasn't. That's the actual model that we would install for okay. free connect systems. Okay, when cool. Your solar, when your system detects export, yep. it'll flick a switch to turn that on. And then just turn that on and use power until you no longer produce the solar, and that'll turn off again. Oh, that's so great. You're always, or you're never paying for okay. the water. And that's the most expensive way to use power yeah. heating or cooling in. Yep. Well, someone told me, and I don't know if it's true, but someone told me. <laughs> don't let that stop you, I <laughs> That 40% of the world's energy is used for heating. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And if that's true, that I find that staggering, and no one's been able to say whether that's true or not, but it's. Um, well, yeah. well, Melbourne is a heating climate, so we use more energy for heating than we do for yeah. cooling. Look at your winter electricity yeah. bills. They're yeah. always higher than your summer. Yep. And Yos, can you tell me about this? What's this setup yeah, so here? So this setup here is... so. The you, whole, had, you had some mushrooms on the walls here last time? Yeah, that was... So this is uh, like a, a total, complete experiment, this place. <laughs> and so we've actually modified and changed it eight times, but we've really settled on, settled on this. So the, the Stable Ultron system goes here and then as part of Joe's daily um, and Matt it'll be Joe that's doing it <laughs> fucking useless at this stuff no, but there's a shelf here and then the hot water that is um, comes out of the back of the hot water unit which normally just goes away mm. actually fills up what steams the and keeps and monitors the, the this is the mushroom basically okay. so all the buckets of mushrooms 48 of them will be in here and that will also be connected to the steam from the shower so we get steam from the from the steam. And the shower's right behind here, and that's so. The reason why this is all here is because the tap for the hot water unit, yep. uh, for the hot water in the kitchen, which uses most of the water, is right there, and the shower is right here. So, so we've got everything within really close to the Steve Eltron um, uh, heat pump. Yep. So that you don't have a long run, so you're not losing heat through your hot water pipe. That's right. And okay. I, so it's I, more efficient. My, in got my it. house at home, our shower is about eight meters probably 10 meters away 
<laughs> and just like, that is the biggest waste of water you've ever, you know, turning a tap on waiting for hot water. So I'm not going to make that mistake again. I did the same thing in Dalesford. We had everything within three metres of the hot water service. And can you imagine how much water that yeah. saves over the lifetime of the house? Yeah. So yeah, this is kind of like the central hub. And it's great because a hot water unit will, of course, expel a little bit of heat and the mushrooms don't mind that. So yeah. it's all, you know. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. And then again, um, using copper um, because, yeah. Because copper's, copper's really valuable at end of life, right? So it has another life at the end of this building. You never see it being thrown away. No, You'll correct. never find <laughs> copper in a skip. <laughs> In you know? fact, sometimes you, you don't find it on the building site when you turn up in the morning because someone's <laughs> taken it. Let's um, go upstairs. Okay, cool. Let's Are you cool? That. Oh, you got another? You... Oh, no, I was just wondering whether you wanted to show us the bathroom or not. Do you want to wait till uh, next month? No, we'll wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's looking, Actually, it's looking well, good. No, I'll show you upstairs. But... We've got our net. This is the net that uh, was made in Williamstown uh, for us to... Stop us from falling down the stairs, first of all. <laughs> but actually weave cucumbers and that sort of thing. Can I just step through the door, Yost? Magical glass. <laughs> so yeah, this is um, the kitchen. So these I'm really excited about. This is little project has been five years in the making. At the footy club in Mombok, I met a bloke called Tremaine. So this has a particular... <laughs> This scent to it, it smel smells Macricarpa. Cy Cypress Macacarpa, those um, windbreak trees you were telling us about last month. Yeah, so this is that same, this has come from the same tree as this. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's Macricarpa, and these were made by Andrew Aramore in uh, Ballarat, who made it the smells kitchen. smells beautiful. And, I know, I love it. <laughs> I love it. And you know what, like, it's at the Stoke House, and the Stoke House is probably three years old, four years old, I don't even know. And you walk in and you still smell it. You can still smell it, yeah. It's so good. So in the greenhouse in 2009, we were on the south side on St. George's Terrace of the building, so no yeah. sun. And I was reading about this company in Holland that had developed the world's first LED light. Rang them. So we were actually one of the first places in the world to have LED grow lights. It cost me about 30 grand to get these lights in. But we, it looked like a disco. <laughs> So what, what, what colour are they? Are they pink? Or? Well, people actually, we had to stop using them because people drove past and went, what the hell is going on there? You know, we, we turned them on at like 1am. So they were on from 1am till 5am. But the light was so bad. It was purple, yellow. It was all the, all the light colours that plants need to grow. Yeah. And it had all the right attributes. Yeah. And the plants grew really well. And it was really low energy because conventional grow lights are really hungry for yeah. power. There are tens of thousands of square meters of, well, tens of thousands, thousands of kilometers really of plants being grown under grow lights globally. And uh, it's to extend the season in winter and it's a huge problem. Like in Holland, they actually have to black out houses now because birds were just flying 24 hours a day and falling out of the sky because <laughs> I thought it was daylight. But anyway, I gave up on, on LED grow lights because I thought they are so ugly. You know, the light is so ugly. And so then I met Tremaine at the Mombok Football Club and he goes, nah, mate, I make LED lights. Well, it turns out <laughs> digital. Tremaine does. Uh, so, you, so, you, so you live in Monbolk. Yeah. And you met Tremaine at the Monbolk Football Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he, he goes, oh, I've just bought a business in Brisbane and we make um, the world's best LED lights. And I said, well, if you can make a grow light that works and looks good, and that's how this project started five years ago. And these lights have just been tested for a year at Queensland University. And uh, it, they've got all the right attributes for plant growth, and they don't use any energy. You know, so you've got. So, a so light when we come back next time, can we see what colours they are? Yeah, well, we actually had one going today, which I probably should have, yep, because they've just arrived, and these just arrived, so we're installing them tomorrow. Okay. But the light is beautiful, and so we've got them in all the spaces because I know this is a big problem. This is like one of the number one and questions so I get because plants need light, yep. and water and nutrients, yep. and for our cities to become urban food bowls mm. we need to sort the lighting out because we've mm. got dark laneways that need to be lit with energy i don't think will be a problem in in the next five years so if when we've got tons of solar power we can light car parks dark floors yep. you know even stairwells we can grow food anywhere as long as we can get that energy from up there and run it through one of these lights and grow food so they've tested it on food crops uh, crops and on um, just indoor plants and have had really good results. 
And there's been some work done by an academic at RMIT, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, believe it or not, that's her name. What a name. Uh, yeah. And she's identified that there's over 30,000 vacant car parks in Melbourne currently. Currently. Oh and God. so uh, what, do you, what do you do with the car park? Perhaps, you know, if, Turn it into if, a real park. If, you, if you could put light in there, then you can get water to it, you can get nutrients to it, then perhaps you can actually turn it to a place for food security, a place to generate our food locally um, uh, without a whole bunch of food miles and carbon attached to it. Well, we've got water. So, I mean, the Rialto alone on its own releases 400, when it's full, releases 450,000 litres of water a day. From what? Grey water. Oh, grey water. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's, a lot of that water is not really, I mean, if we knew that we were using the water, we would separate the water from yeah. the toilet to the water that you use for washing your hands in. And there's so many great systems that are available that can clean that water through electrolysis or filtering. And so, you know, I've got no doubt in my mind that urban food is the future. And this is a big game changer. Well, I we think. hope so. Otherwise, Matt and Joe are going to get a whole lot thinner while they're here. <laughs> <laughs> have, a look at, have a look at these, um, the buckwheat. I mean, I've never grown buckwheat before. This is the first time. That's just out there. And when I read the digger's seed packet, it said, ready in six weeks, I'm thinking... No way. No way. Have a look at it. It's already the first seeds are already being pollinated and uh, first flowers are pollinated. Joe and can almost reach out and get it now. Yeah. Yes, can you tell me about um, why the use of stainless steel bench top and then what is this and what's the, what's the choice of this material? Well, I mean, I chose this because um, I was cleaning a vase in somebody's house yeah. and they had this sink yeah. and I asked how old it was and it was eight years old or something yeah. like that and it still looked like this. So I yeah. thought, wow. And because I've got black trims, black uh, window frames, I thought it would be really good practical way to use it. And I just love, I, I, I did consider... And so what, what, I, what is, what's, what's this constructed of? It's a, um, like a, uh, what do you call it? Is it? It's, it, it's um, steel, but yep, it's okay. got like a carbon... Oh, um, like a coating on it. Coating on it, yeah. Okay. And then I was considering doing a zinc. Yeah. Um, sink. Yeah. But you know, the welds and soldering the welds and trying to make that all work. And so this is zinc, not stainless. Yeah, this is oh, zinc. We talked about that last time. Yeah, the guy that actually did this. Because it went, does feel nice and soft. I love zinc. Yeah. And I just, in a hundred years time, after, long after I'm gone, I know that this will look even more beautiful, you know. Yeah. And I love it when you get lemon and acid and, on it. And, and just like copper, it's worth something at the end of its life and so it will be reused. It was really interesting because I said to the guy, gave him directions and most people need, you know, that need to know exactly what, and he goes, no, I know where you are. How? He goes, I know Fed Square. I've spent two years putting all the zinc. <laughs> putting all the zinc on the outside. And it was the same guy, you know, so. And they put zinc on the outside here because it doesn't rust. Yep. Glass indefinitely. Yep. So, Yost, you're gonna show me the buckwheat? Yes, let's come outside and see the garden. So we had our first um, cooking experiment here yesterday. Matt and Joe were cooking for some friends. Mac Forbes and a couple of, uh, of his mates. And yeah. So what I've done is um, planted what, what you call sacrificial plants. So the, my philosophy is that if you try and um, grow things that, you know, uh, I'm trying to grow stuff without, without chemicals or pesticides or anything, you're going to get um, caterpillars and you're going to get you know, butterflies laying, laying eggs and, and all that sort of stuff. So you may as well plant stuff for them so they don't stuff, uh, touch the stuff that you can see. So you can see the kale they've gone crazy for. Yeah, it looks like the kale's been really stripped. Yep. But then you look at like the beans and the other stuff, it's perfect. So but, if- But Yost, there's no caterpillars on this now. What, where are those caterpillars? They're up at uh, being fed to the yabbies. <laughs> so you really fed the caterpillars to yeah, the yabbies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So we, it's, we it really have... is a closed loop system. Well, I mean, and you know, like I've got chickens at home. We've got a couple of chickens coming here. They're not here yet, but they go crazy because they're just chlorophyll filled, nutrient dense mm. bugs, you know, that they go crazy for. So, and this is a soybean. And so what's your plan long term to, stop, to stop caterpillars eating the rest of the You just food? keep planting stuff like, um, you know, there's lots of things that caterpillars prefer over Herbs and stuff are usually a little bit more resilient because they've actually, the reason why they're herbs and that why you use them is for that, you know, that smell of flavor, which is actually repels a lot of insects. But, um, but have you planted specific um, plants to try and repel? 
yeah. you know, caterpillars or, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So there's uh, upstairs you'll see calendula and certain things interplanted okay. and... Well, when we go yeah. up there, can you show us that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, cool. Apples are starting to take off. Oh, no, that? it's incredible. This is a, I don't know what, what the variety is, but I know it's from New Zealand and it's grown by JFT Nurseries in Mombok. And they reckon it's the most nutrient dense apple in the world. It was bred by a New Zealander. And um, yeah, it's, we actually lost quite a few on this side when we transported them, sadly. And then, yeah, we've got parsnips, uh, pumpkins, zucchinis. This is um, some native pepper, which is absolutely beautiful. And uh, that's actually grape dried as well. And um, we've got dill. This is quite an amazing plant. This is a uh, Japanese tea. It's uh, camellia. And you actually, in Japan, they have this fresh. So they'll pick two leaves and then pour boiling water over it. Got some oats. Um, oats are great to plant because... Um, yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> Joe's going to need that later. So you can see they're actually ready. When, the, when they start to produce that, that milk. See that, that milk? That's when they're ready to harvest. So you can actually juice them. It's really good if you have um, cancer, apparently. Uh, it has lots of anti-inflammatory um, properties to it. And you can see like the pumpkin is just going out of control. This is supposed to be going on the other side, but anyway. <laughs> and um, I've noticed that the silver, th this is um, um, horseradish. I absolutely love horseradish. It's just going out of control. We've got some asparagus, more apples. Zucchini, um, mountain pepper, rhubarb. And the zucchini's already flowering. This is pawpaw, some celery, some herbs. This is called a magic bean. I have no idea what it is. As a, one of my favorite places in the world is a bookshop in uh, Callista. And uh, Tom Roberts Bookstore. Yeah. If you ever go there, it's insane. He sells all secondhand books. And he gave me five seeds and he said, these are the best beans in the world. And uh, they're perennial. Did he trade you them for a cow? <laughs> <laughs> if look he at, did, let's rocket. climb up. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's amazing. The rocket is going really, really well. Let's, so let's go upstairs. I can see as well here, Joe's been busy painting. So that's been quite interesting, actually, trying to find a completely natural way to finish you know, the, the floor, we're using Porter's um, lime paint. But it's amazing how many people say, yeah, we're natural, 100% natural. And then you start doing a little bit of research and you go, well, it's not 100% natural. You can't, like 100% natural is there's nothing in it, you know. And so is lime paint just lime and water? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. And which is what calcium carbonate. Which is what, just, which is what they've been using forever. Minerals. And of course, it's not that practical, but in places like Greece, they just paint their walls every mm. year. That's what you do. You know, once a year, you just put a coat on it. Yeah. And... Um, the more practical it, it is, is practical it is, if it doesn't give you it doesn't off gas though <laughs> it doesn't off gas and it actually breathes so it was really important for me to use a finish that could breathe because of, of the carbon we put biochar in the walls oh that's right in the dura panels yeah yeah and so as soon as you lock it up there's no point in having that but also it's kind, you, of, kind of nice how you read the dura panels as well like you, you read those shadow line between it and so you can see that it's not a plasterboard wall that it's something else here. yeah yeah all right let's, let's go, go upstairs, upstairs. It's our Frankie kitchen for uh, sink for the. Um, this is going to have. We'll have the incinerator in it, and um, all the veggies, scraps, and everything will go through that and go straight into the biodigester. These two are either making love or they're fighting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now we're having a fight. <laughs> See how? Yeah. Put it in this one, you reckon? Yeah. There you go. So we had, um, yeah, we, we lost a few, um, we lost all of the barramundi because the system, without anyone realizing that the system was turned off, which was devastating. 
So but it was it, a big it, lesson learned. Like we, we, um, that's why tomorrow we're wanting to engage the solar system, get the battery wall up, yep. so we don't have that stress anymore. Yep. So you've got to keep the water moving, you've got to keep the you've water to, aerated, and you've yeah. got to keep the nutrients moving out of the barramundi into the plants. Yeah, yeah. so it was really interesting because we've got the freshwater mussels in there, and the guy, we lost two freshwater mussels, and uh, we spoke to the guy in, Queens, in uh, New South Wales. This is Chris Bissells from Full Potential Landscapes legend that's set all this up and he's gone we've got to get the fish in the water's too clean they uh, actually the muscles rely on you know and oh, that's I thought, what a lesson yeah. learned you know yeah. so yeah this is pretty intense this has just gone absolutely crazy as you can see this has gone really 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 bananas up here <laughs> and you know there's yeah like here i've planted a bit of borage and but these are uh, chickpeas and the chickpeas are actually very close to flowering then I planted some salvias up the end here, which will grow over. Um, these beans need to be staked. Magic beans. <laughs> from, Callista, from Callista Bookshop. And um, it, you can see the snow peas had, like Joe said, no flowers yesterday. They need to be staked. Here's a calendula that started to flower. You can see the first beans. So these were all, I'm not lying, they were all planted on the 20th of 25th or whatever of August. And yeah, it's, you can see this is, this one bin here is hungry. There's something not quite right here. Can you see how yellow? If you look at like those, um, the corn here, how lush that is, there's something not quite right or out of balance here. And they're all pretty much the same, even though you've got beans growing there. Probably still. Oh, thank you. And how did you make the topsoil, Yoast? So the soil in here was made by nature soil which is um, um, a couple of guys, th uh, three guys in Monbolk. It's good. Silver. It's good, isn't <laughs> in it? In Monbolk, of course. Everything's in Monbolk. Anything you want, you can get in Monbolk or Callista. <laughs> and uh, yeah, those guys make, have been making soil for over 20 years. And I actually used to have a worm farm on their, at their, their place. At, that used, actually used to be our, our family farm and then was taken over and then they set up a soil business. Australia has got this incredible heritage of making potting mix out of waste. Yeah. America and Europe and Asia have ubiquitous um, um, peat available. So, so they just so, mine peat. So they just mine peat. And it was really interesting. Destroy about, the environment. <laughs> about 15 years ago, Tesco <laughs> said, we will not accept any more plants grown in peat. So they came out from the UK, or uh, nurseries came out from the, from. Europe to try and work out, hang on, who makes soil out of anything other than peat? Australia was the only place in the world because we didn't have naturally occurring peat. Colac's got a little bit of peat, but it's not the stuff that you can use for potting mix. And so they learnt that you can make soil from waste. And so this is uh, predominantly pine bark, coconut fibre. Um, I pretty much put tenant elements in it. It's got um, diatomaceous earth, got worm castings, biochar. There's about a thousand kilos of biochar that's gone into all the soil. So there's about 35 tonne of soil in total. And so who are they, like, like, if you're making soil, who are you selling that to? Are they selling it to potting this, mix companies? Yeah, or? so between 60 and 70% of Australia's nurseries and flower farms are in Monbolk and surrounding yeah. area. So that's why potting mix companies are based there. Yeah. And if you're growing magnolias, you'll order a, a different blend to somebody that grows basil. Okay, so, so Nature Soil probably makes a thousand different blends for, okay. for different um, growers. So my father-in-law would use a different blend for growing Christmas trees than growing, um, say, herbs. Yeah. So you've, you know, some plants need a high airfield porosity. Some plants need a high pH or a lower pH. Some, uh, if you're growing natives, you need different nutrients. Some need more. So if I'm doing a rooftop garden <laughs> for one of my buildings, I should speak to Nature Soil. Absolutely. Get the right mix. And there's, there's <laughs> others. There's Debco, there's BioGrow. We've yeah. got some bloody awesome, really yeah. professional companies. And then... Um, and world yeah. leading in Australia. Yeah. In Monbolt. That's it. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it, you can see here how important it is. And I was just saying, you know, before, you, you can just see how good this stuff is, you know. And it's not, this can't be rushed. Like this takes a bloody long time to make good soil. It's not like going and digging. Well, if you dug it out of the Sherbrooke Forest, you'd have some bloody good soil too. <laughs> but, you know, this takes a long time. You can see how dark it is. But um, it's also got about a ton of ground up scallop shells in there, <laughs> which I think, you know, there's salt and... Uh, and, and uh, it's got some calcium in it. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, a little bit of seaweed and that sort of stuff. 
So yeah. And rock dust, actually, I forgot rock dust. It's got rock dust in it okay. too. And rock dust is um, really good for worm. Worms pick up little bits of rock and they put they swallow the rock and use grit to break down leafy like oh. dead leaves and so they actually need it to digest food. Oh, right. And then it's also other microflora break that rock dust down and give you the give the plants the minerals. So I always have rock dust in, in it as well. It's okay. like a slow release fertilizer and it's food for soil biology. Okay. Okay. There you go. So yeah, I'm pretty blown away with how quickly this is all grown. And you've got more solar up here, yes? Yeah, so there's six panels up there. We've made it so that there's actually um, a gap in between so we get some light through as well. And then of course in winter, this is facing north, so there's lots of light going in from this side as well. And We've got the net hanging in there. We've got a balustrade coming in as well. But the net is really there, you know, so we can have climbing plants and, and yeah. And you've got the net suspended on uh, galvanised pipe. Yep. So, again, it's just steel with a zinc coating on it. Yep. So, at the end of the building's life, that can, can be use. reused again. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And then tomorrow, we've got the final doors being glazed, which is really cool. So, yeah, these are the Forster window frames that I discussed with you last time. And, um, so really, really deep reveals on there, yo. So it looks like, you know, this can hold, you know, like a, a 30 mil section of glaze or glaze. Yeah, in, in Europe, they actually do up to um, triple glaze up to 65 mil. Okay. And so what, that can so, sit in the entire frame here? Yeah, and you just have a much smaller bead. So the bead size it, is uh, dependent on the glass okay. thickness, so you can actually... And so what are you putting in here? Double glazing? Double glazed um, Viridian uh, Light Bridge Next, yeah. which is off its head because it's made in Dandenong. <laughs> it is made in Dandenong. And, and they use a lot of recycled glass content in their glass. Yeah. yeah. And they actually did, I had the guys out actually, they did that. So all that glass was made in Dandenong as well. But um, I love it because it's actually got a soft coating on the inside, so it's really quiet. When you, you notice downstairs how quiet it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so we've got the a double panel straw wall. Yeah. And then double glazing with a soft coat on the inside of both panels. Yeah. So the sound travels in and gets locked up inside. I reckon it's about 35% more uh, quieter than the previous um, wow. glass that they were selling. Okay. So that's it. I think we're pretty close to uh, wrapping up. Thanks heaps, Yost. I can't wait <laughs> to have the bloody place finished. I'll tell you what, it's been, I'm absolutely exhausted. Um, Joe's been an absolute champion and the whole team, Lockie, can't believe he's still here. And um, yeah, that's one thing about this project is that, that there's so many people that really want it to succeed and want to um, make it a success, I suppose, and, and see it happen. And, you know, I passionately believe that we should be growing our food where we live because once you, once you grow something, you just become much more engaged in the food system. You become more aware of the weather, uh, your environment. And I just think it's a great way to connect to the natural world. And I've seen it with kids, but it, same thing with adults. Once you start growing one thing, it could be Italian parsley, but just have one pot and then it becomes two pots and suddenly you're growing a whole bunch of food. You don't have to go this extreme, but um, why not? <laughs> thanks for uh, joining us and Jeremy. Thanks so much. <laughs> oh yeah. Are we still doing that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys. When the world gets better, let's build a better world. Of better values and choices. With cleaner homes, cleaner energy, cleaner coastlines. With better products from better materials. Using less, but giving more. When the world gets better, let's just get better and better. Miele immer besser.